Hi everybody. So I want to do two more examples of strong induction. One of them is a problem from the book. It's problem 13 on page 195 and I picked it because it's similar to an example which is worked out in detail in the text. Um, and the other is actually an example from the text um, which is about uh, counting, which is about the relationship between the number of vertices and edges in a tree, which is a very, very tiny taste of a branch of mathematics called graph theory. So let's start with um, exercise 13 on page 195, where we're asked to prove that n cubed minus n is divisible by 6 for all n. And as I, I mentioned, I think in the text, the problem that they ask you to look at is that 12 divides n to the fourth minus n squared for all n. This is a very similar problem, um, and you run into the same obstacle. So, so first of all, why, why do you have to use strong induction? Why won't regular induction work? Well, let's do a dry run. So here's our dry run. We're going to um, try to do this by induction. So first of all, uh, p of 1 is the statement that 6 divides 1 cubed minus 1 or 6 divides 0, which is certainly true. p of n is the statement that 6 divides n cubed minus n. And what we want to know is, suppose p of n is true. So 6 divides n cubed minus n. Is p of n plus 1 true? Does 6 divide n plus 1 cubed minus n plus 1? And pretty much the only thing we can do here is to expand out this polynomial and look at it, and we get that n plus 1 cubed is n cubed plus 3n squared plus 3n plus 1. And n plus 1, we'll put that here, and we'll subtract and we get n cubed plus 3n squared plus 2n. And the problem with that, this is, um, this is n plus 1 cubed minus n plus 1. The problem is, doesn't look divisible by 6. So our attempt to prove this in a straightforward way by induction fails. Okay, so what do we do? Well, one thing to do is to um, try to use strong induction. And remember what that means is that instead of just assuming that p of 1 is true, we're going to assume that all of the earlier statements are true, and we're going to see if that helps us. So try again with strong induction. Well, uh, let's look at a few of the early examples and see if, if we get anywhere. So, for example, what's p of 2? p of 2 is the statement that 6 divides 2 cubed minus 2, or in other words, 6 divides 6, which is true. And p of 3 is the statement that 6 divides 3 cubed minus 3, which is 27 minus 3, or 6 divides 24, which is true. So we do kind of have reason to believe that this statement works out. And the trick in this problem is to try to get a 2, or get more of the, of the numbers that we need, into the polynomial that we're going to look at. And the observation is that although it's not the, we don't see any obvious um, 6s in n cubed plus 3n squared plus 2n, what if we look at n plus 2 cubed minus n plus 2? So this is p of n plus 2. Well, that works out to be n cubed plus, let's see if I can do this right, 6n squared plus 12n plus 8. And here's n plus 2. And when we subtract, we get that n cubed plus 6n squared plus 12n plus 6 minus n. So you notice I didn't subtract 12 
the n from the 12n and get an 11n. We, I mean, instead, I wrote it this way. n cubed minus n plus 6n squared plus 12n plus 6. And now we have these great sixes here. And here we have n cubed minus n. And by the inductive hypothesis, since n, n occurs before n plus 2, we know that n cubed minus n is divisible by 6. So p of n plus 2 is true if p of n is true. In other words, we've proved p of n implies p of n plus 2 for all n. Well, that doesn't look so great because that's, but if we shift our indices a little bit, in particular, this means that p of n minus 1 implies p of n plus 1 for all n. And let's remember how strong induction works. To use strong induction, strong induction says if p of 1 is true and the conjunction, the, the, the and, p of 1 and and p of n implies p of n plus 1, then p of n is true for all n. So to apply strong induction, we notice that p of 1 is true. And we'd like to know that, we're, and, and if we assume that all of these earlier ones are true, we can conclude p of n plus 1, which is the fake. We can do that because um, we, we're, if we assume all of these are true, then in particular, we're assuming that p of n minus 1 is true. And if p of n minus 1 is true, that's enough to make that p of n plus 1 is true. So um, we can apply this to our situation and get that 6 divides n cubed minus n for all n. Now, maybe you found this a little confusing. There's another way to look at it if you like. What we showed here is that if you skip a statement, you get the implication. So if we start with p of 1, this is a little bit of a di this is another way to look at it. If we assume p of 1, then we can conclude p of 3 because we can step by 2. And we can also then conclude p of 5, and we can conclude p of 7, and so on. So regular induction would tell us that p of n is true when n is odd. In other words, if n is odd, then 6 divides n cubed minus n. On the other hand, we also know that p of 2 is true. We checked it. Uh, p of 2 was it, it's because 2 cubed minus 2 is 6, so we checked that it's true. And again, with the two-step, we know that p of 2 implies p of 4 implies p of 6, and so on. And from that, by regular induction, we know that if n is even, then 6 divides n cubed minus n. And so in this sense, we've actually proved that, um, that 6 divides n cubed minus n for all n. So this, this is a slightly different way to look at it, where instead of thinking about it as strong induction, you can think about it as two completely different inductions, two completely regular, different regular inductions, one that you've done for the even integers and one that you've done with the odd integers. Okay, one more example. This comes from the text, and in the text they talk about a tree. So a graph, maybe we'll start with a graph. A graph, this is one meaning of the word graph, different from the one that you're probably maybe used to. A graph is a collection of points with lines between some of them, some or all. Here's an example of a graph.
So it has, it, formally speaking, it's a set of edges and a set of vertices. So it's a set of vertices. Those are the dots. And a set of edges. And since we know this terminology, the edges are a subset of the Cartesian product of the vertices with itself. So each edge is an ordered pair of vertices, and, and the ordered pair of vertices are the two um, endpoints of the edge. A tree is a graph without cycles. So a cycle means a, a sequence of edges that you can traverse from starting at a vertex, following a sequence of edges, coming back to where you started from without backtracking. So this is not a tree. It has a cycle. I just traced one out. Here's an example of a tree. You can sort of see where the name comes from. Here's a tree. It's a graph and it has no cycles. And the, you notice that this tree has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine vertices. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight edges. So the number of vertices is one more than the number of edges. And that's what the proposition says. That if you have a tree which has n vertices, it has n minus one edges. And the proof of this is by induction. And it's kind of a nice argument that you see um, in these kind of combinatorial situations quite frequently. So let's suppose we, so the proof, proof of the proposition. Well, if your tree has one vertex, then it has zero edges. I should have made clear because the only way you could have an edge would be if it went like that and then it would have a cycle. So that's no good. Oops, put it back. So uh, the proposition is true uh, when there's one vertex. So suppose we look at P of n, which is that a tree with n vertices has n minus one vertices, has n minus one edges. And let's look at, um, we want to show that P of n implies P of n plus one. So imagine you have a tree with n plus one vertices. So here's our tree. It's got n plus one vertices. I'm just going to draw it in a kind of a random way here. Okay. So the way we're going to prove this is we're going to pick a, to so to, to prove this. So take a tree with n plus one vertices. Pick an edge and remove it from the tree. So, for example, let's cross out this edge. So now what happens? You're left with two trees. right? There's a tree over here, and there's a tree over here. And um, this is where you use strong induction. Each of these have fewer than n vertices. So let's say... Um, tree one has K one vertices. Well, by the strong induction hypothesis, because it has fewer vertices than, uh, than N plus one, it has K one minus one edges. And tree two has K two vertices and k2 minus 1 edges. 
Now let's put the two pieces back together again. So when we combine them, the original tree has n plus 1, which was k1 plus k2 vertices, because each vertex was in one tree or the one half or the other of this tree. They're not really halves because we did this kind of at random. But And how many edges does the original tree have? Well, the original tree has k1 minus 1 plus k2 minus 1 edges. That's the edges here. And the edges here. Plus the edge that we took out. which is equal to k1 plus k2 minus 2 plus 1 minus 1, or n, I mean, n plus one, k1 plus k2 is n plus 1, or n edges. So we've shown by induction that when you add a vertex to a tree, the tree grows by one vertex and one edge, and the number, the difference between the two stays one. So by, this proves the proposition. So this is a, a very nice result that's worth pondering. It's actually the beginning of a um, very deep subject in mathematics, which some of you may have known. Um, but I'll just maybe I'll just tell you a fact, which is harder to prove, which is that if you have a connected graph, meaning all the vertices are joined together, there's not I mean, this is a non connected graph. That's not allowed. All the vertices are connected. And you take <clears throat> the um, number of vertices minus the number of edges. This is equal to 1 minus the number of cycles. Or put another way, the number of cycles is equal to 1 minus the number of vertices plus the number of edges. So for a tree, Remember, we just showed that the number of vertices is equal to the number of edges plus 1. So edges minus vertices, so 1 minus 1 plus e plus e is 0. In other words, this is a, uh, if, if you have no cycles, then the vertices minus edges equals 1. That's what we just proved. Um, and if we look at it, maybe just for the fun of it, here's an example of a graph which has how many cycles? Well, it has one, two, three, four vertices and one, two, three, four, five edges. So number of cycles is E plus one, which is six, minus V, which is four, or two. And here are the two cycles, this one and this one. You have to be a little careful about counting cycles. I mean, what about this one going around the outside? And the reason that doesn't count is because technically that would be this cycle plus that cycle. So th this is really counting not the number of cycles, but somehow the number of independent cycles. Maybe I'll put this in quotes. But, um, but it's still... Uh, uh, this is called the Euler characteristic, and uh, it's, it's a really beautiful piece of mathematics for your later study.